here we are, March 23rd, 2023, the last day that Bob Martin is showing up at the CLF <laughs> offices. I guess tomorrow is technically your last day. Right. And I'm sure you're going to be, you know, at your desk at 8 a.m. with your coffee, you know, waiting for everything to roll in on your last day. But um, so his your second to last day. And um, I'm Tom Philpot, uh, Senior Research Associate at the Center. And we are um, doing an interview with Bob to sort of capture his essence on his way out as something that we can, um, you know, that we can have and show people in the future. Um, although Bob, we will still be har uh, harassing Bob. Um, <laughs> this is not our, um, my last conversation with Bob. I plan to uh, keep the communication channel open, but I, I thought we could start, um, you know, you come to this work, you come to this position from a different way than a lot of people. Um, you, you, you come from politics, from Capitol Hill, and also from journalism. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your start in journalism and politics and how that all came together. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for doing this, Tom. I appreciate it. And I, I am going to stay in touch with you and, and the center as an associate. So I'm, I'm looking forward to um, reaching what would be comparable to a senior judicial status if I were a federal judge, okay. get paid to not work. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's just, uh, I'll work, obviously. Well, so I was the editor of my high school and college newspapers, and um, I had a really strong interest in journalism um, as I went through school. Um, I was in college at the time of the Watergate uh, scandal, and journalists had a, you know, a strong reputation because of that. I uh, graduated Phi Beta Kappa from the University of South Dakota, but with a degree in political science. Um, and I went into journalism because that uh, that was a little more interesting to me, um, uh, primarily because of, of having done it in high school and college, but also watching what important changes journalism could promote in the Watergate scandal. And there's also Vietnam. There's incredible investigative journalism around Vietnam. Yeah, Pentagon Papers. Yeah, Pentagon Papers. Um, uh, the uh, Neil Sheehan's The Bright Shining Line. He was a New York Times reporter, I believe. Um, and so his reporting on, on Vietnam really shaped public opinion uh, about, about getting the United States out of that. Um, so I worked on a daily newspaper in Western Pennsylvania, a little town called Jeanette. Um, and um, uh, I, I was very familiar with the political leadership in South Dakota and the Democratic Party. Um, I was a roommate, um, shared a house with one of George McGovern's daughters and one of Jim Aberyst's kids. Um, and, um, and they were both the sitting U.S. senators from South Dakota at the time. Um, and in 1977, um, I got a call from um, a man named uh, Tom Daschle, who was uh, Jim Aberesk's state director in South Dakota. And I didn't know Tom. He's a little bit ahead of me at, at South Dakota State. Um, and he said, I understand, you know, you're, uh, you're a smart political guy and that you're a good uh, journalist. Uh, would you consider coming to work on my first campaign for Congress? At that time, South Dakota had two congressional seats, um, basically... Uh, the eastern third of the state was one, and the rest of the state was the was the second one. So I did that, um, and um, uh, after uh, reporting and uh, kind of uh, talking about what everybody else was doing, I I wanted to make, have a more active impact. I, at the time, I remember someone, a journalist, saying, "You know, my job is not to." more in the demise of the world just to report it. And I've, I have always been more of, a, of an activist. So that led a long line. I've worked for the last four Democratic senators from South Dakota, uh, worked for Dan Glickman, and he was a member of Congress. Um, in between there, I worked for the Kansas Farmers Union and the National Farmers Union. I was the uh, associate editor of the National Farmers Union newsletter, so I always had kind of a communications capacity. And when, you, when you're working on these um, on these staffs, were you working in like the press office? Uh, three of the four, I was in the press office, yeah. and one I was the um, I was in the constituent service office. So um, I had a very young age. I uh, working for Senator Abresk. I was his deputy press secretary at the age of 25. Um, so I've always had this communications, but also this kind of advocacy. Um, uh, mindset. And um, after I was on the Hill, um, 
And I saw the, uh, actually a lobbyist told me about his wife was at the Pew Charitable Trust, uh, and they were talking about this commission to look at, at the damage uh, of industrial livestock operations on public health environment, uh, animal welfare in rural communities. And growing up in the Great Plains, you could not help but see the demise of family agriculture. It was just apparent everywhere, you know, empty ghost towns, you know, fewer farmers. Um, and I've always had kind of the um, uh, prairie populist attitude about large companies, uh, not, the, not the nutty yeah. stuff going on now, but um, uh, you can't grow up in Kansas and South Dakota and not be knowledgeable of people like Mary Elizabeth Lease uh, in the 1890s that, that talked about raising less corn and more hell. <clears throat> so, and the Farmers Union was, was a small P populist grounded uh, group too. So um, all, that, all that led to me to, to really want to, I, I aggressively pursued the commission position, the executive director of the Pew Commission on Industrial And what Farm year Act. was that around? That was about 2004, 2005. Um, I think I started, um, the way I looked at it was the Pew Charitable Trust was, uh, from a Hill viewpoint, was considered a bit right of center. And Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, I think it was maybe Bloomberg had just been added, was the number one public health school in the country. And I thought, people are going to pay attention. Policymakers will pay attention to what these two groups say about, about these issues. Um, and we developed a really um, really robust commission. I mean, former uh, Kansas Governor John Carlin, who I'd known and actually worked for for a time and ran one of his campaigns, uh, was the chair, uh, Bill Nyman of Nyman Ranch, Dan Glickman, uh, Marion Nessel from NYU, um, Mary Wilson, Dr. Mary Wilson from uh, Harvard. Uh, she was part of the original core, cohort of clinicians that challenged the inappropriate use of antibiotics in, in the clinical setting in 1978. Uh, Bernie Rollin, uh, the leading farm animal welfare expert in the world, really. Um, Jim Merchant from uh, Iowa State, or I mean, sorry, the University of Iowa. He was dean of school of public health. So we had this really <clears throat> robust group of people. Um, and it was, we. I think we interviewed or looked at about 180 people uh, to get down to 14. And then we ended up, a couple people uh, stepped off the commission because they couldn't devote the time we were we were asking. So, so the, it started in around 2004 and it took some years for it for the process to play out of choosing the people and then, then to do the actual work. Right, we actually got rolling in March of 2006. Um, it took about 18 months to, because it was basically um, myself, uh, Sean McKenzie was, was supporting the commission. Uh, Bob Lawrence, the founding director of CLF was the principal investigator for the, for the uh, grant from the Pew Trust. But at that time, CLF had like six people. Um, so, uh, we got a lot of support from Hopkins. Um, a lot of the, some of the technical reports we did were authored by Hopkins faculty. Um, got a lot of support from CLF, but it, it took a long time to get, get up and running. So March of 2006, we started and we released our uh, final recommendations, April of 2008. And had you known the folks at CLF before when you were um, on the Hill? I had not. Um, I was not aware of CLF. It was it was relatively new. Um, it was founded in 1996, so I mean it was about eight years old. But um, again, it was it was really a fledgling operation at the time, six maybe eight people. Um, but I was very aware of uh, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Um, and once when I when I looked at the information available about CLF, I thought, well, this is a perfect home for the Pew Commission. So at around that time, I was. Um, just starting out 2006 or so, cover, 2005, 2006, covering this this topic as a journalist um, with Chris Magazine. Um, and um, I remember when the report came out, which was in 2009? Yeah, uh, no, 2008. 2008. Yeah. I remember um, most of the issues that were covered by the report, I was, I was pulling at these strings as a journalist and um, a lot of the times, a lot of times it seemed like, you know, t to let's say one's editor or some of one's readers, like these were fringe topics, fringe concerns I was bringing up. But um, I, re I just remember the report coming out with this authority and it was something that you could cite 
And it, um, like you said, it wasn't from some, you know, let's say, you know, wild-eyed California organic um, <laughs> operation. It was from the, Pew, you know, Pew Charitable Trusts and Johns Hopkins. And it made this stinging critique of the, the food status quo. In particular, I think the... Um, I think that one of the main takeaways that I, that I really focused on was on antibiotics mm -hmm. in animal production. But I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what the, the Pew Commission report concluded um, in this. Yeah, we, so we reviewed about 180 um, peer-reviewed um, papers. Um, we did uh, two full days of taking input from in public hearings. Um, and then we had ongoing conversations with members of the industry. It's, it's interesting. The industry initially tried to kill us, um, but we, we reached kind of a wary, um, uh, you know, uh, agreement that we, that we would cooperate. Environmental groups wouldn't, wouldn't talk to us, um, mm -hmm. which was really odd. Well, one, one did the environmental integrity project, uh, worked with us. Um, so we um, developed 28 primary recommendations uh, in the four areas we were studying, uh, public health, environment, animal welfare, and rural communities. Um, and each of those 28 had several sub-recommendations. I, I think the last time I totaled it up, it was like 150 sub-recommendations. So we'd, we'd make this broad statement and say, and here's, here's what this means. And, and we were a consensus group, so we talked uh, on developing recommendations and sub recommendations until we couldn't agree anymore, and so some some of the areas had forty sub recommendations and some had two. So it, we didn't want to we didn't want to damage the overall success of the report by coming to loggerheads on some sub agreement. So yeah. our main uh, public health recommendation was to end the non therapeutic use of antibiotics in food animal production. Totally end it. No. Uh, the, the use of antibiotics in food animal production historically had been to uh, for weight gain, <clears throat> but um, and those those have been phased out primarily, but they're still used in um, preventative uh, uses and quote unquote yeah quote unquote preventative and those are the same protocols as weight gain yeah. so it's still daily routine low level uses so the uh, reduction has not been significant. Uh, our number one public or our number one environmental recommendation was to end liquid waste management systems. Um, you know, ban them and then phase them out, uh, and that's primarily dairy and swine production. Um, we also recommended for poultry production composting, um, and none of that, <laughs> none of that's <laughs> happened. Uh, animal welfare, we said um, in uh, battery cages, uh, gestation crates, tail docking uh, in dairy cattle, and polling, which is uh, a term used in cattle production where you cut the horns off without any anesthetic. Um, and then the number one uh, rural community recommendation was to aggressively enforce the antitrust laws. And so we said, uh, if, if you can't do all 28, do these four. And if you can't do these four, aggressively enforce the antitrust laws, because we looked at that as the center of the dysfunction in the system. Too many companies, or I'm sorry, too few companies controlling too much activity. I want to just go back a little bit. Um, talk me through uh, why you think the environmental groups didn't um, participate. Was it that they didn't trust these two centrist kind of organizations or, or what was the? Yeah, I think so. Uh, at the time, the Pew uh, Charitable Trusts um, had an environment group um, that was very small. When, when the Pew Commission started, I'll bet the Pew Charitable Trust had maybe 50 employees. Uh, the environment group maybe had three or four. They funded outside efforts to to do their work, um, and I think the Pew funded group was the National Environmental Trust. So there's lots of competition among environmental groups, um, and I think some of it is uh, organizational identity. You know, they didn't they no, they don't want to work together because they're all trying to raise money from foundations. They're all trying to attract membership, and you do that through independent action and media. Right, and um, it's it's interesting. I've I've talked to um, Eric Schlosser quite a bit about it, who's who's a friend of mine, and he sees the same thing. Um, he's he's very knowledgeable about um, nuclear regulation or the control of nuclear weapons in, in the world, and he sees the same dynamic in 
in those groups working to control nuclear weapons. They're so competitive, unnecessarily so. Uh, a lot of it in on um, ag reform and environmental reform, I think, is driven by fundraising concerns, you know, from the public, from their members, or well, I've, I've got to be this special group because I need this foundation money. What a terrible dynamic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's really, so I think there have been some efforts recently to try to bring that together, but I've not, I've not seen um, much real progress in that, in that yet. That, if anything, there's a kind of a, a proliferation of environmental groups. I do see a lot more, just anecdotally, I, I really didn't ever thought about this very much, but I do see a lot more where Food and Water Watch and Center for our, uh, food safety and a bunch of groups are signing off on the same thing, uh, yeah. which, which seems positive. Yeah, that it, and and the center's been involved in that. Some yeah. uh, Food and Water Watch, Friends of the Earth, Center for Food Safety, Center for Science and the Public Interest. They there is some cooperation, um, and that is a that is a positive sign. Yeah. Now, um, what about the industry? So tell me a little bit about the industry trying to shut it down and then the negotiations to sort of keep them on board. Yeah, well, it was very it was very interesting. And, and I was glad that we worked out an arrangement because we couldn't have um, had the access to some of the facilities we saw without industry support. Um, so there, was, there were a group of uh, four or five companies um, um, and there's a Animal Ag um, Alliance, mm -hmm. I think it's called. Um, it was the umbrella group, but Smithfield, Tyson, um, Purdue, Ignortis. Um, but they they came to National Cattlemen's Beef Association, which is is it's not a producer group. It's, it's a, a processor. Yeah, group. it's a processor yeah. group. Um, came to me one day and and basically said, um, "We're not going. We're going to kill your your effort. We're not going to cooperate." We're not going to give you access to information. Um, and I, I said, well, here's the deal. We're going to have a report. Um, I think you have an opportunity to influence our findings if you talk to us. I can guarantee you'll have zero influence on our findings if you ignore us. But we're going to have a report. That is um, very similar language to what a journalist tells a company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's probably some of my journalism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, and so we worked on, it's interesting, we had weekly phone calls with an, a group of industry reps. Um, and I was, uh, I always led them. I had, we had a very small staff. We had the smallest staff of any Pew funded commission. We had uh, four people and me. And th that was because we had, we could rely on the resources here at Hopkins. And we had, we had a number of, like I said, faculty helping us. We had a number of graduate students, PhD candidates helping us. And, and we had the, you know, the financial structure of Hopkins helping us watch our, our grant and stuff. So, <clears throat> and a lot of people at CLF too. Um, but the, the Pew Oceans Commission, which was right before ours, had, had 20 full-time staff. Right. And, and so we, it, it was mainly me talking to the industry with a, a couple, uh, I had our policy guy uh, on the calls and, um, you know, and, and one of our organizers. Um, I was as open as I could be. I never, I never told them, never gave an inkling about our findings. I, uh, and I wasn't really sure. So we released them in April of 2008. I wasn't sure until January of 2008, our last meeting, that we were even going to have a final report. Why is that? Well, there was, there was still some, we were working on consensus. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was going to ask you about the herding cats process. It was, yeah, it was, uh, I, I used to be more patient than I am now, <laughs> but it was it was twenty years ago. So, um, uh, and and John Carlin was an incredible chairman, uh, so patient. He was a dairyman by by education and training. Had been the speaker of the Kansas House of Representatives um, back in the seventies. Was a two term governor, um, and so he was very good at you know hearing people out hearing points of view. And and I think I think we spent the first 15 months building trust among the commissioners. We met every quarter. Uh, so every three months we would get together um, in different parts of the country um, uh, talking about recommendations, uh, talking about what we were seeing, uh, talking about what we were reading. Um, and, but it took a long time to build that trust. Um, sadly, we had a couple of people that 
Uh, one in particular I was sad that we lost was uh, Dr. Lonnie King, um, who was the head of the veterinary school at um, Ohio State. Um, and he went to the CDC to run their zoonotic disease office. Um, but we, ha we had such, such talented members. And, um, and so was it a big challenge to get that, that process of getting people to agree on the consensus for each? Um... Yeah, you kind of, you just had, it's almost like a, Fred Kirshenman was on the commission um, who had been the head of the Leopold Center at Iowa State. Um, about two thirds of the way through the commission, he became the president of Stone Barns in New York. Um, and his, his dictum was, um, uh, you, you talk it through until someone says, I'm sorry, I just can't accept that. And it's kind of a loose thing. It's, uh, I was told it's like a, how a New England town hall meeting works uh, or used to work. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really about trust. And we had, I think early on, I won't name any names. We had people that commissioners that wanted to try to, you know, co-opt the direction of the commission and influence its outcome. And uh, one of the things we said early on, there's not going to be a minority report. It's going to be one report, and we're going to agree on on all the findings. And I think um, because we met every quarter, um, and there was, you know, I made everybody take the meals together. You know, it was kind of kind of a silly thing, but I didn't want people like going off on their own in little chunks of three and four and plotting. That sounds horrible. But, yeah. You know, I wanted everybody. I wanted to build a group dynamic and, and kind of a jury kind of. Um yeah, Dynamic. exactly. Um, that's a very good analogy. Um, you come to a common understanding of the facts and then you make a decision. And um, when it came out, um, talk a little bit about the reception um, in media, uh, by the industry. Um, how did it go over? Well, I thought it went pretty well. So we had, a, we had eight technical reports um, in different aspects of what we were studying. And, and there were no recommendations in those reports. They were really... Um, what we call name the trouble. You know, here, here's an analysis. And we, we had, I think, probably 25 academics from around the country uh, working on different reports. So it was a very robust effort. Um, we had kind of a, a truncated uh, National Academy of Science uh, peer review process. Um, so they were all, all the reports were peer reviewed. We did a series of Hill briefings on the main reports. And um, it was really interesting uh, in one of them, um, the um, and we were we were very open. We said here here are the co-authors of these reports, and we're going and we're going to do a hill briefing on that, and we're going and they're going to come. Um, and one of them uh, on our animal waste and the impact on the environment report, uh, the industry uh, decided uh, to try to undercut the report by going to the authors and at, and telling them they're going to release your recommendations. And you're not going to have seen them, which was not true. So weird. Yeah. yeah. So they got they got the three authors to sign a letter um, recanting their involvement in the Pew Commission. Oh wow. Um, and and they got it to. Um, That's a nasty piece of work, huh? Yeah, <laughs> and, and kind of it's emblematic, but fairly typical. Yeah. Um, um, and they they handed it out to the press at the at the Hill briefing. Our Hill briefings were were packed, by the way, too. It just was really incredible. So um, uh, Dan Morgan was the Washington Post reporter that they got it to. Great reporter, yeah. yeah. He came and and asked me, and I and well, and then when the when the briefing happened, it was we weren't releasing recommendations. We were just talking about the contents of the report. So so they these authors had been misled. Um, by the industry. And, and so the story came out pretty balanced. Um, and I, I went to the, uh, to the deans of the schools where each of those academics were based. And I said, so uh, your um, faculty member has violated a contract with the P charitable trust. And you're going to get them to recant their recantation <laughs> or the next letter you'll get will be from the pew lawyers. Um, and and they all recanted. They all you know, said, no, we were misled by the industry. So, I mean, that that was a microcosm of, of the lead up to the final report. I think the final report resonated pretty well with the press. Um, I think that 
Um, it was the first time, I mean, I think the way you described it is very good. It, reporters interested in the topic, the information was kind of diffuse. And, and this report, uh, I think, was the best organization of the available knowledge at the time. Yeah. And in, in a, in, in, told in a good narrative. It's and kind of a miracle that it didn't get co-opted or didn't get watered down or. Yeah, it was. Another report coming out, undercutting everything that was in the, you know, like a minority report or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we, there was a, uh, the Farm Foundation had done a report uh, called Meat in the 20th Century um, that was uh, run by Charlie Stenholm, who had retired as, uh, he was a member of Congress from uh, Texas. And it was, it covered some of the same ground as ours, but the Farm Foundation never does recommendations. They just say, here's here's the problems we see. So we built on that and I think sharpened it and did a more uh, in-depth dive. Um, the uh, American uh, AVMA, American Veterinary Medical Association, put out a 40-page rebuttal to the Pew Commission report that you know, landed like a brick. Right. It's their AVMA is funded by the pharmaceutical industry. Well, actually, it's great to use anti human antibiotics in yeah. <laughs> yeah, production. There's, there's, that's the funny thing. <laughs> there's no there's no science that shows any connection when there was lots of. Science. Oh yeah, I mean that that was it. That was the sort of party line forever and ever, and I think maybe still is to some degree that yeah. oh you can't show a connection. Yeah, and even though even though you've shown many connections. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it was it was apparent in the early 2000s, and now there's research that shows uh, uh, low level use of antibiotics in poultry has a direct link to urinary tract infections right. that are that are uh, resistant to treatment. Yeah, that's very well established. Yeah, so I think the I think the media um, response to it was very good, and I think I think initially I think a lot of advocacy groups were kind of surprised it, they. Because of what you said was was true, they thought, well, it's conservative Pew and and CLF didn't have much of an image, so let's stay away from this because it's going to damage our advocacy ability. I think it actually kind of galvanized and refocused all the advocacy on this on, in this issue, in this area. I'm pretty sure it's when I first became aware of CLF as a as a thing. Yeah, um, around that time. Now, so it comes out in 2009. Um, 2009. Obama has just come into office. Um, he's got the Senate and the House. He's got an extremely um, tiny mi uh, majority in the Senate. In fact, what was that with the Minnesota senator? That election took forever to, to play out. And yeah. It took for a while. Uh, who was the senator? The comedian? Um, yeah. Yeah. Al Franken. Yeah. It, yeah it he, took, beat, he beat Norm Coleman. Right. And it took six months for him to actually sit, I think. But um, so, you know, here we have this moment um, – Omnivore's Dilemma has come out, um, Eric Schlosser's book, Fast Food Nation, Mary Nestle's book. Um, Pollen does that, you know, very widely read uh, farmer, is it Farmer in Chief? Yeah, Letter to the Farmer in Chief. Yeah, um, his New York Times Magazine cover um, explaining a lot of, really a lot of what's in the report to, directly to Obama in this uh, open letter. And, uh, and I was in the ground at that time reporting for Grist, and it seemed like there was this moment of, a possible legislative change because I think one thing the report makes clear is that um, for these changes to be made regulations were going to have to change like you were going to have to tell people no you can't spray manure on this field that's going into water and getting on people's houses no you can't feed these vital medicines to animals on a daily basis that is undermining their effectiveness um, so Tell me a little bit about like how it played out in Washington, and and you know let's we can start getting into the progress we've seen since the report came out here in 2023. Sure, well, and that's right. There seemed to be a lot of momentum. Um, Omnivore's dilemma before the Pew Commission report, um, the you know Fast Food Nation a little bit before the Pew Commission report. Um, there was um, Wendell Berry. Um, Fred Kirshenman and uh, Wes Jackson had a 50-year farm bill proposal. And a big op-ed in the New York Times, mm -hmm. uh, right around that same time. Yeah, uh, Food Inc. Um, had just come out. Yeah, that and, came out in 2008, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so th there, there seemed to be this incredible momentum. Uh, Obama was shown um, in, the, in the North Carolina primary some of the main recommendations from the Pew Commission. And he, I used to have the uh, article from, I think it's the North Carolina uh, or the Raleigh News and Observer, where he said, that's going to be my 
blueprint for reforming wow. animal agriculture. Um, and he had also, in Iowa, in the primary, he had come out, um, I think, for a CAFO moratorium. Yeah, he did. And also for, um, he was also talking about consolidation as a problem of these um, these meat companies. Yeah. So it seemed like we had a guy who really got the issues. Yeah. And, and there was a lot of optimism. Um, his uh, nominee to be the head of the Food and Drug Administration, Margaret Hamburg, um, was a public health grounded physician. Um, it's actually a protege of Dr. Bob Lawrence. Um, right. I didn't realize that. Yeah. And she said, I remember in her um, uh, confirmation hearing, because the Pew Environment Group um, kind of seized on the start of the Obama administration as a way to make a big push on all these issues, especially antibiotic use. They stood up a campaign, uh, a $3 million campaign in 72 hours to, to promote antibiotic reform. She said, we ought to be approaching antibiotic resistance as if our hair were on fire. And she made the wow. connection yeah, in the hearing between human use and animal use. Um, but then, you know, then kind of the bureaucracy took, took control. And uh, FDA is a very sluggish uh, bureaucracy, and there were there were career appointees that slow walked everything. Um, Dr. Josh uh, Sharfstein, who's at Hopkins now, was the deputy director of FDA. Uh, he, so he was Margaret Hamburg's uh, next in line, and he definitely gets the issue. Yeah, he like definitely he, gets yeah. the issue. He left within about a year. Yeah, uh, and I think she was just. Uh, there were some people that had been prominent in the FDA and the Clinton administration that were brought back in, a guy named Mike Taylor, who who was had done a good job on food safety reform uh, under the Clinton administration. He was kind of head of the Center for Veterinary Medicine or the, the, the food animal side at FDA, and he was he was kind of industry friendly. Yeah. So um, and and his industry friendliness is a little overstated because um, I mean you know he worked for Monsanto early in his career and that he got sort of tagged with that and he wasn't like Monsanto's man at the FDA but he did you know want to get the industry perspective and didn't want to do anything too fast and kind of slow walked yeah yeah I, I that's a good way to put it he slow walked it yeah I I had uh, he had been brought. Um, to the Pew Commission as a possible advisor, paid advisor. And uh, when he found out we were going to have animal welfare recommendations, he said, I can't do that. I can't be affiliated with something like <laughs> that. So, and that's fine. Um, so, yeah, I think there was, um, it was, it was really interesting in December of 2008. So the report had been out for, since April. Um, Senator Ted Kennedy's office approached Pew um, and said, we want to tackle antibiotic uh, regulations in, um, I don't remember if it was the Animal Drug User Fee Act was coming up for renewal, but they wanted to highlight it and attach uh, what was then, uh, Kennedy was the lead sponsor in the Senate, Louise Slaughter, the lead sponsor in the House of the Preservation of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act, which was not as robust as the Pew Commission recommendations, but it would have been a big help. Right, it would have gone a long way to reducing antibiotic use. So it it would slap a fee on it to make it not economical. Well, it would actually put the put the restrictions in in the legislation, so it wouldn't be a fee. It just you couldn't do th certain right. things. Yeah. Um, and um, there were there were a couple of hearings. Then sadly, Senator Kennedy fell pretty quickly. Um, and yeah, he sure, dies in two thousand nine, right? Yeah. Yeah. During so, the Obamacare. And then that um, kind of not very bright guy, remember, um, um, won, the, won the special election to take his place? Yeah, what was his name? Yeah, the Republican guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and he didn't care at all. Oh, yeah. And, and Sherrod Brown of Ohio um, became the chairman of the of Senate uh, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. And <clears throat> I remember going in and meeting with his staff. And one of the things that, having worked on the Hill, that used to drive me a bit crazy about some members is they they didn't necessarily want to do things that might alienate opposition voters. And um, I used to tell members I work for, well, they're not going to vote for you anyway. I know. I, what, what, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and Brown was the same way. He said, oh, his chief of staff told me that, oh, we've got all these hug producers in, in Southern 
Ohio and and Sherrod's up for re-election. And, and I said, but those aren't his voters. I mean, they're they're never going to vote for him. And one thing I always like to point out to politics, you know, about politics is the number of hog producers in southern Ohio, even if they all formed a block and voted against you, it's like 100 guys. <laughs> that's, right. <laughs> that's right. And they, and they are going to form a block and vote against you anyways, yeah. which is what your point is. But even, but it's just industrial agriculture has depopulated, uh, has, you know, has eliminated most people from farming. And therefore, the farm vote is, uh, is a, just a rounding error. Yeah. That's exactly right. Even in even in a place like Iowa or Ohio, I it just it used to um, well it kept some good people one that I'd worked for from from being you know very courageous sometimes. I, I've I've worked for some guys that were just they didn't care they were going to do what was right. You know, like yeah. Jim Aberesk was an amazing guy. Tom Daschle, an amazing uh, politician. And I think the world of Dan Glickman stay in touch with him. He was an amazing politician, but he he when I was working for him never really wanted to alienate the Farm Bureau. Um, and I'd always say they're not they're not going to vote for you. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that dynamic re- remains to this day. Yeah, it remains to this day. Uh-huh. And it's probably gotten worse. Yeah, and then um, you know you said that the sort of like ultimate you know if you do nothing else respect this recommendation about competition and consolidation in agriculture. Now, Obama came out guns blazing on that issue, and but what the hell happened? Well, I think the industry organized to oppose him and uh, successfully and re- with their Republican allies, uh, especially in the Senate. Senator Pat Roberts of Kansas is uh, just devastated Obama's efforts to try to do that. Um, there was a guy that um, in USDA named Dudley Butler uh, who was trying mm-hmm. to modernize the grain inspection packers and stockyards rules so th- so they could be more aggressive and work with DOJ <clears throat> and they just uh, led by Pat Roberts who's in the pocket of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association uh, basically forced him out of office and I think I think it was uh, well I think there's just been a bipartisan failure to to make much progress one thing I'd say about Obama is um, I think he gets so overwhelmed by health care reform and the fact that in 2010 there was this Tea Party wave that he lost the House and yeah. and the Senate was was closed. And so I think he got more focused on, well, um, I need to save the Affordable Care Act. That's got to get passed. And so everything else kind of took, took a back seat. But um, – it, I think it was just the the power of the industry, certain yeah. stuff. But but I do think because of that, you see what Biden is doing. He's kind of said, okay, it, it, these aren't really new issues now, and they've never been yeah. that new. But you know, Obama, uh, you know, pursued them, laid the groundwork. The industry came out and opposed. Things have gotten worse. Now, oh, yeah, the consolidation since then has been tr- tremendous. Yeah, and yeah. and people are starting to feel it. I think COVID helped when you know when three hundred uh, processing workers in four plants shut down the meat uh, production supply chain in the United States. That's like, oh my God, how does how did we get here? Well, so I think Biden is doing a pretty good job of trying to bring these issues to the forefront, filing lawsuits, uh, antitrust suits, that sort of thing. And that gets us to where, you know, when you're pushing for these kinds of changes, you get these moments like Obama wins in 2008 and he's got this, you know, he's got both chambers of the um, of the Congress. You get moments like that, but they can be quite fleeting. And this was like less than two years because of this um, situation in the Senate. And um, and then, uh, you know, the, the health care debate really just sucked everything dry in Washington for about a year. Yeah. There was just nothing else going on and it was just this massive uh, project. And then the 2010 election happens and for the rest of his time in office, I think the house, he didn't have the house. Yeah. Um, and so he, you know, he was playing defense basically for the rest of his administration, you know, following six years. But you set groundwork for something that 
the time it rolls around right again and you can make some progress on it. Yeah, and I think that's the way most issues progress from my experience on, on Capitol Hill. Um, they always say it takes about three farm bill cycles from the introduction of a new concept to actually being included. Um, one of the members I'd worked for, Senators, was Tim Johnson from South Dakota. His signature, uh, one of his signature ag issues was country of origin labeling. Worked years and years and years with Chuck Grassley uh, from Iowa. Um, and I think I think it took three farm bills to get that in. And then, then of course, it was, you know, challenged in the world court, knocked out, and has come back um, with, a, you know, a, in a forum that is supposed to satisfy the world court concerns. So, yeah, it, ta it takes a while. Um, and I think that's, I mean, I think, I hope people in rural America kind of get past what they think Biden is and look at what he's really trying to do for rural America. Yeah, I want to get you looking forward. Um, probably should go ahead and start doing that now. Sure. But do you want to just say a quick word about antibiotics and the, the voluntary rules that the Obama administration ended up putting forward and, and where we are now? Um, well, they've not been very effective. I mean, I think that if you look at um, by species, uh, antibiotic reduction has really been mostly in the poultry sector. And I think that's been because of marketplace pressure. Um, the uh, Purdue, um, a four or five years ago, invited a bunch of us to come over to their headquarters, Jim Purdue himself, um, to talk about uh, why why the center is always a thorn in his side every time he wants to put a chicken house on the eastern shore. <laughs> uh, a letter from the center will show up at the local county commission, and we always do that at the request of local people. We, yeah. ne we never just like assume. Um, so um, we went and met with him, and he had phased out all non-therapeutic antibiotics by that time. Uh, he said it took him like five years. Um, and he said something about, um, well, we did that because of consumer pressure, not because of you guys. And, and I said, well, who do you think got consumers all fired up? Um, and, and so I, I think there's a market-based response on the poultry side. Um, once Purdue did it, Tyson's had to do it. Um, others, I think Sanderson Farms is the only one that that has not done much. They've said we proudly use antibiotics because we want you to be safe, which is like, <laughs> ridiculous. Know. Yes, it is ridiculous. But let's just just really briefly note how before that the industry said, "Oh, this is impossible. If you want us to do this, your chicken's going to be twice as much." Yeah, There's, and and it's not. It's yeah. not true. Yeah. Well, and that's one thing about the Pew Commission. We said. We don't expect these to be implemented overnight, but in a decade, we ought to have all the non-therapeutic antibiotics phased out of animal production. Yeah. That way, the the industry can evolve. It's not a shock to the market. It's not a shock to consumers. <clears throat> and they basically ignored it until... So then, groups like the Pew Environment Group and and Keep Antibiotics Working, uh, which is a, is a great group, Farmers Concern Trust, all have been pushing, NRDC, National Resource Defense Council, have all been pushing to reduce antibiotic use in food animals. And once there is consumer demand and, and Purdue met that, then others started following suit. It's really not been reduced in swine production at all. It's not been really produced, uh, reduced in turkey production. Um, beef cattle use has never been a huge problem um, because of the way cattle are raised. They're, Antibiotics are used most inappropriately in beef cattle in the feedlot finishing stage right before slaughter. Um, and that's only because they're fed things that cows aren't supposed to eat. Yeah. And they, they can't digest well. And so it, it causes liver abscesses and liver cancer. So to, to keep that at a minimum, they still use antibiotics inappropriately there. So there's been, there's been some progress. Um, I mean, I think I think almost none of it's regulatory. I think yeah. It's, I think it's been market-based. Yeah, they left a huge um, gaping loophole and the industry just ran through it. Yeah. And this um, preventative versus therapeutic. Yeah. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit about where, the, I mean, I think the, the lead up to this about just sort of laying the groundwork and being patient and staying at it. Where do you see... Let's, um, let's use the, the Pew Commission as sort of a, as a, of a milestone. Um, and the recommendations in the Pew Commission is a milestone. And, you know, very few of them or none of them have been implemented. Um, what are the prospects going forward, do you think, for things like 
competition, um, you know, rural communities, um, you know, my colleague Mike Milley and I from the center here just went down to North Carolina last week and saw not much progress, actually no progress at all has been made in North Carolina, Eastern North Carolina, um, hog and poultry territory. Um, where do you see all that going? Well, I, I think we're, um, I, I try to be optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think most of the progress um, is this kind of, um, you know, Obama to Biden, you know, you lay the groundwork in one administration and, and the next administration of that same party can make more progress. Um, I think that, um, I don't think we've made much of a dent yet in the antitrust stuff. Um, I think that <clears throat> if you look, if you look at what I consider the avenues of, of reform, you know, or uh, legislation or regulation, uh, marketplace or the courts, I think we made the most progress through the courts. And um, I think that, um, I mean, CLF has been involved in providing public health information, um, both at a local level, state and federal levels on regulation, but they've also been asked to be like expert witnesses in, in lawsuits trying to stop um, some of these operations. <clears throat> the winds have been pretty few and far between. There was recently um, in a Tyson case um, that was, I think, litigated for like 10 years uh, about the over-application of poultry waste in the Illinois River watershed in uh, northwest Arkansas and northeast Oklahoma, which led to the pollution of Lake Tenkiller, which is a um, water source for the city of Tulsa. That was just decided in favor of public health, right? So, but it took 10 years. Yeah. Um, the um, the use of the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act um, in the Yakima Valley in the state of Washington to force cleanup of groundwater was a success. Um, I think some of the nuisance lawsuits in North Carolina uh, were successful, but but the discouraging thing about that approach, I think, is it's kind of a slap on the wrist of the industry and just cost of doing business, right? Yeah. $50 million, nothing. Um, so I think the, um, uh, I've been talking to friends in the movement, the food reform movement, that uh, we need to build um, political capacity, that um, elections matter. Um, and some groups are doing that, uh, like uh, Friends of the Earth and Food and Water Watch in Maryland. Their, their political wings, their political arms, uh, did um, surveys of all the gubernatorial candidates about some priority issues. Um, some of them not really um, animal ag, but things like, you know, controlling the waste of the poultry industry and, um, you know, limiting the size and uh, pursuing worker rights and those sorts of things. Uh, then we, then the Center for a, Livable, for a Livable Future did a poll on those issues in Maryland. Um, uh, we've polled in Maryland about three times now to show people that these these positions are popular with people. It's it's you're hearing from a vocal minority when the industry is criticizing, and even on the Eastern Shore, our polling has shown that people want the industry regulated. I mean, they understand how important they are. They don't want the industry, you know, um, eliminated from the Eastern Shore. They see some of the benefits, <clears throat> but they also want clean water and clean air, and they want to protect the bay. And if you have to, if the industry has to be re regulated to get some of that, they're for that. So I think, um, I think there's always an important need for the public health view on these issues. And I think that's what CLF brings to the table. And you also have Joe Maxwell's group with his five. What is it called? The, um, Farm Action is yeah. It's his. It's his big group. Um, they have a um, uh, an effort C4, to C four right. Yeah, they have a C four effort to uh, impact the farm bill. It's called Food Not Feed, um, and they're we're collaborating um, with them. Um, I think <clears throat> if you look at um, you know, like the APHA, American, uh, American Public Health Association, passed a CAFO moratorium resolution in 2019. And if you read the things that need to happen for them to consider lifting the moratorium, it's, it's all the Pew Commission recommendations. Right. And, and that was done deliberately. 
yeah. um, because people at CLF were the ones that got that passed. And and Senator Booker, Cory Booker from uh, New Jersey, um, he was kind of holding off on introducing his Farm System Reform Act that has several components that um, would really improve agriculture. He saw that and won the big chunk of it as a moratorium. Um, he saw that and then he dropped the bill immediately. Um, and and we're, we continue to, uh, we've done a couple of polls on national moratoriums, uh, moratoriums in Iowa, North Carolina. Um, they're very popular. Um, people in Oregon have been proposing uh, a moratorium on CAFOs there, citing Center uh, for Liberal Futures public health work uh, to promote it. So uh, it's, it's, um, taking a lot longer than I thought it would, but it's still, people are still fighting for it, so. Yeah. One thing you said that was really interesting just now is that um, when a new, when, when there's a new idea that comes up in, in farm bill world, it, take, it takes a few farm bills for every five years. So we're talking about a pretty long time horizon. And I'm just thinking about these marker bills that Senator Booker has been dropping, including the Food System Reform Act, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's got a, a lot of incredible stuff in it. And obviously, in you know the farm bill being negotiated now, as we speak in twenty twenty three, it's not going to go in there. Yeah. Um, but do you see the possibility of an idea like that hanging around and finding its time in a couple of farm bills? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, it's I think it's important that Senator Booker's on the Senate Ag Committee. Mm. You know, from a, a New Jersey City guy uh, is on the Senate Ag Committee. Um, I'm. I'm sure that those ideas will hang around and make it in a farm bill eventually. So that's the importance too that CLF brings to this uh, these issues is there's so many students that come to Hopkins for public health because yeah. of CLF now. Yeah. And so we're training kind of the next generation of, of uh, ag reform activists too. And I'll tell you, anytime that CLF weighs in, uh, in our opinion, is really sought after by a lot of advocacy groups because it's so unusual for a school of public health to comment on these things. Yeah. You know, we're the only, I think we're still the only group in the school of public health that's doing this. Um, uh, Kelly Brownell at Duke has a, has a food system center, but I think his is in maybe the political science department. Um, and, and you always hear people say, well, I'm academics say, well, I want to build the CLF of the North in Columbia, or I want to build the CLF of the South in Duke. So we're we're still pretty much the gold standard, and um, and you know when the Pew Commission started almost twenty years ago, I don't think there were that many students coming here because of the issues, but they are now because of CLF. Yeah, and I remember talking to Bob Lawrence when I first took this job on, and um, Bob was telling me that when he started it, um, when he started that when he was involved in the, the founding of the CLF in the 90s right no 96 yeah he he thought well this is this idea just makes so much sense it, it makes perfect sense every school should every school public health should have one and they will and he's, he was a little surprised that well after you know 25 years or whatever hopkins is still the only one that does yeah it's really so um the berkeley food institute is some a group that try is going to try to do this but so they're the school of business um uh, school of uh, public health the law school and another, and they're never going to have the public health lens that we do. Um, I mean, Berkeley is a great school, but it's not the number one school of public health in the country. Right. And and the Berkeley Food Institute has too many agendas it's trying to pursue. Right. We we're pretty pretty well honed on ours. Which is industrial animal livestock production. Yeah, and I think now we're branching into okay. So what? We, we've really well documented the problems associated with industrial animal agriculture. So what's our alternative? And I think you'll see us in the future, um, after I'm gone, um, advancing that more of an alternative, which is really um, also a very good thing. 